Welcome, North Campus. As Ace has said, my name is Titus. I get to be one of the pastors here, and it is a joy to be opening up God's Word with you this morning. If you do not own a Bible, maybe it's your first week back, you joined us on Easter, or maybe today is your first week, you might not know that we actually give away Bibles for free every Sunday. So if you need one, you don't own one, raise your hand right now, and one will be given to you by Asa. You can keep in it, write in it. You'll want to flip open to the book of First. First Thessalonians, where we will be for the majority of today. Uh, But we're actually going to start by picking up where we left off last week. We left off with the resurrection, that Jesus actually, physically, event in history, he got up on his own two feet and he walked out of that tomb. So I'm going to pray and then we'll dive in. God, I am so grateful, Lord, to be here. Lord, I was just meant to be a conduit. Help me to be a good conduit, Lord, to say all that you want to say and say nothing more than you want me to say. Lord, would your spirit do uh, work in my life and in theirs, reminding us of the hope that we have beyond the grave that cannot be shaken. Lord, that we would leave here and we would live in consistency with that hope. God, speak clearly through my mouth today. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. So we're picking up with the resurrection of Jesus, and we're asking the question, okay, what happened right after that? What what was the effect on Jesus' followers when they saw Jesus alive from the dead? And we're in Matthew 27, 51 through 53, and it reads like this. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. I remember I had read the Bible the whole way through, cover to cover. And then someone pointed out this verse. I was like, how did I miss that? Because here's what it's saying. On the day of Jesus' death, he's being crucified. He says, to Telestai, it's finished. All the sin debt's been paid in full. On that day, God does some supernatural works, and one of them is the tearing, not from the bottom to the top. This would have been a a curtain about four inches thick. He tore it from the top to the bottom, symbolizing that that holy of holies place, that if a man would have looked behind the curtain, except for once a year as the high priest, they would have been killed. And yet now it was torn from top to bottom to show that an access that previously didn't exist had now been obtained by Jesus. That we, yeah, we as sinners, we had access into God's very presence. And then there's this earthquake. He's like, I want you to make sure you don't miss this. Something big's happening right here. And he shakes the whole earth. And as he's shaking the earth, you have rocks splitting and tombs being opened. And now we're fast forwarding from that day, his crucifixion day, to his resurrection day. And Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Well, he was never intended to be the last born from the dead. In fact, what you see here is it says many saints who had fallen asleep, a euphemism for they died. So some people who worshiped God around the area of Jerusalem had died. They were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his, that's Jesus' resurrection, they, these saints who previously had fallen asleep, they went into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and appeared to many. I don't know about you, but that still shocks me. That verse is like, are you serious? That happened? Like, Asa, I thought you were dead. What, you're back? Like, that would have been such a weird moment. What's going on here? And there's lots of questions we won't get into, but it's like a mini foretaste of what's promised to come. It's like a mini burst of power to show what's really, what we're all looking forward to, which is the bodily, physical resurrection of all the saints. The idea that death really has been undone, and not only is Jesus gonna resurrect from his death, dead tomb, but so will I. Like if Jesus doesn't come back in my lifetime, that after Titus dies, he will raise me someday from the dead with a physical body to be with him on the new earth for eternity. And that is a hope that cannot be shaken by something that happens in this lifetime. No matter how much evil or cataclysmic events happen, that's a hope that cannot be shaken. It's what all believers hope for, and this hope is not wishful thinking. Not wishful thinking hope. I sometimes say, I hope the Seahawks will win. That's wishful thinking. This, this is a hope that's different. As John Piper wrote wrote in his uh, article, What is Hope? Biblical hope is not a mere desire for something good to happen. It's confident expectation and desire 
for something good in the future. And you're asking, how can you be confident in something that you can't make happen? How can I have a confident expectation when I couldn't make myself resurrect from the grave? I look at all God's promises and I witness them, faithful, 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 faithful. And then when he says, Tyson, I'm gonna resurrect you too on the day you die, that there will become a resurrection at the end of the age where all saints will have a physical bodily resurrection to be with me for eternity. I'm like, okay, you're gonna be faithful and I'm looking forward to it. And this type of thinking after they had just seen Jesus come out of the tomb and they had seen these other saints who had fallen asleep come out of the tomb and then all of a sudden he's like, okay, and it began to change the way that they think. In fact, like Paul writes, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's like, if I get to live, I get to continue proclaiming Christ. But if I die, if you take my head here in this prison, I get more Christ. I get to see him face to face. He's like, in my economy, that's gain. And so Jesus' followers, they're emboldened. I love what Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is assurance about what we do not see. And these followers of Jesus, they spread the gospel in the same city where Jesus was just crucified for saying that he was the Messiah. Like it would have been one thing for us to be like, okay, they just killed Jesus. Let's go to South America and tell everybody that Jesus is Messiah. But no, they go back right into the same city where they just crucified him and they start spreading the gospel, which most of us know what that means, but it's to say there is a holy God who has created you and me. We were made in his image, and then we rebelled against God. And because of our rebellion, we are helplessly broken away from God. Our sin has separated us from him. In and of, in and of myself, I cannot make myself right with him, which is why God sent his son upon the cross that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. They went and they proclaimed this message of salvation, that Jesus really was the promised deliverer who saved mankind from his sins in Jerusalem, but they didn't just talk. Because Jesus didn't just talk. Jesus taught, but he also healed the blind and the leper. He also touched the outcast and welcomed to eat with him tax collectors. See, there is this talking of the gospel, but there's also a living of the gospel. And Jesus did both, and his first followers, they did both too. You're like, okay, what did that look like? In Acts 2, it says they were devoted to the disciples' teaching, the, the apostles' teaching, and you have fishermen, tax collectors, ex-prostitutes, ex-demoniacs, and they're all calling each other brother and sister. And there's this supernatural love and generosity that they shared with one another where they're willing to sell things they have to meet each other's needs. It was countercultural, all the while still saying, Jesus is the Messiah. In this countercultural living, it brought mixed results. And if you do the same thing, which you've been called to holy living just like they have, and you live counterculturally, counter it too will bring mixed results. Because in one day, 3,000 people joyfully receive the message that Jesus is the Messiah. And 3,000 people are added to the church on that day. So sometimes, as you share the message of the gospel, and you live counterculturally with love, radical love and radical generosity to people that have never even met you before, they might receive it with joy. Some will receive it with skepticism. It's kind of weird. You guys are kind of weird. You call each other brother or sister. That's weird. Some people will be jealous, as we'll see later in the story. And others, they will see you as a threat. You proclaim this gospel and they actually see it as offensive and they want you to stop talking. They say, oh, it's okay that you have a, a faith in Jesus, but keep it to yourself. You might have heard this in your job somewhere. That's a private matter. Don't, don't let that affect the way you do business. Don't talk about that. And Jesus is like, no, we're going public with this. In fact, your faith in me, not only do I want you to talk about it, but it impacts the way you father it impacts the way you do business. They're like, no, that's just the way we do business here. We, we cheat, we lie, but we don't call it that. And you're like, no, 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 I can't. I'm a whole person. What Christ is in me, he now changes the way I do everything. And so some people will persecute you even though you're radically trying to show them love. And I wanna answer a question. Why does the gospel cause such a great offense sometimes in some people? I think there's probably more than these three reasons, but I thought of three. The first is because of its exclusivity. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
There's no other way to the Father except through me. And when he says that, he's saying all the other gods that you people worship are false gods. And all the other claims of ways to God the Father actually lead to death. And so some are offended at his claim of exclusivity. The second reason I think that the gospel can cause such a great offense that people would actually persecute those who promote it is that the gospel challenges the status quo, how people make their money or maybe it's their power, and so they see it as a challenge and a threat to them. And lastly, I think it can be offensive because the only people who can grasp the gospel are those who humble themselves. You can't come to the gospel proud, I don't need help. No, you gotta be able to say, God, without you, I would have never made it. Lord, I can't make myself right with you. Instead, I'm so grateful you poured your wrath out for my sin upon your son, and I never deserved it. Thank you. So people sometimes are so proud, they're like, this causes me offense. And let's pick up the story in Acts 8.1. They've been living counterculturally. They've been promoting that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus has ascended into heaven, and this, this happens. Saul approved of Stephen's execution. It's the first time Stephen had been a follower of Jesus. He had promoted that Jesus really was the Messiah in Jerusalem, and they eventually arrest him because he, he speaks it with such power. And they arrest him, and he's trying to share with them, like, listen, you see this pattern? You keep on persecuting as God sends messengers to you, the prophets, and you guys killed them, your fathers and grandfathers, they killed them, and now you guys, you killed the righteous one. They don't want to hear that, so they stop up their ears, and they mob him, and then they stone him to death under the uh, approval and organization of Saul, who we'll find later in the story. Let's finish that verse. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they, that's the believers, were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Okay, the pattern of the first church is to love God. Actually, I actually have a slide for you here. You have faith. You believe that God has loved you, and you respond to that, and it leads to this love, this supernatural love. People should look on, in on us, and they're like, something you guys got going on is not natural. The way that you guys are willing to forgive one another and care about and put each other's needs first, something supernatural is happening there. Your generosity. And that love leads to mixed responses, some joy, some skepticism, some jealousy, and some persecution. And the question that I want to ask today is, they leave Jerusalem, they're scattered, this persecution breaks out, like a smashing of a ball of seeds, they go everywhere, but then this time you'd think they would say, oh, okay, I'm going to stay quiet, I'm not going to talk about Jesus as the Messiah, but they don't, they keep doing it, they keep on creating these Jesus communities and, and setting up churches and they start, keep on living this way and speaking this way, how did they stand firm and not stay silent in the face of persecution. I think it's back to our first verse that we read. They had a hope that this life is not all there is. In fact, your persecution begins to get so bad, it actually ends my life, but I have life after death. You can't stop me. I'm just gonna keep going. Lord, if this is what you want me to do, Lord, help me do it until, okay, either I die physically or they take my life. Either way, Lord, this is not all there is. They had a hope beyond the grave that enabled them to stand firm in the face of persecution here. And so I want us to learn two things at this spot. The first is this. What you hope for changes what you live for. What you hope for right now, your greatest hope is changing what you live for. So if you can't figure it out, you could actually look around your life and what you're living for will show you what your greatest hope is. Ask yourself a different question. What are you chasing? Oh, when I get married. When I have kids. When we find a house in this crazy market. When I get that job or that promotion. Ah, when I retire. I'm two years from retirement. When I have grandchildren, because they're easier than children. Whatever it is that you're hoping for, these aren't bad hopes. But there's only one spot for who you're going to worship, and it's God alone that he would be your ultimate hope, that you would hope, God, I just wanna be with you for eternity. That's my greatest hope, Lord, that it would impact the way you live. My second thing that I want you to pull from this first section is this. They faced great persecution. If you receive persecution for your faith, it's normal. 
It's not abnormal. In fact, Jesus promises we would. But know this, God will command even trials in your life to do you good. Romans 8, 28 says, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So if a trial comes into my life, like the great persecution came into the life of the church, he commands it to do it good. And how is good coming out of this? Notice this. It scatters the believers throughout Judea and Samaria. Jesus had already said, listen, go into the world and make disciples. You're gonna start in Jerusalem, then go to Judea, that surrounding region, and then into that spot, Samaria, that no Jewish good person would go, and then to the ends of the world, and this persecution is forcing them to go. It's doing them good. The church continues to spread, and they stand firm by hope. Now, I wanna take a look at that phrase, stand firm, because it's the title of the series we're in, It's commanded numerous times throughout scripture. And I've asked Asa if he'd help me with an illustration. When I was in elementary school, I just had a hard time listening to long lectures. And so I've always learned more kinesthetically. And this hoop represents gospel. It represents believing the gospel, that there's a holy God, I'm a helpless sinner, that Jesus is the perfect substitute, and that my response is to believe, right? Right? But it also represents, standing in here, it's going to represent this idea of living a life consistent with the truths of the gospel. That I would live a life of integrity, whether I'm in business or a parent, of love. So I'm going to actually move you a little bit right there. So I'm going to put that hula hoop on the ground, and I'm going to ask you, representing all believers, you're commanded by Scripture to stand firm. Stand firm. Now, through this whole illustration, all you got to do is remain there. And if you remain there, you win. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Now, I am gonna try to lure you away. I could like tempt you over here with something. I could try to like shame you and make you feel silly right there so you actually run and hide. Or I could just try to shove you out of it, which I will try later. Um, <laughs> let's go to 1 Thessalonians because here's the tie-in for today. 1 Thessalonians chapter four, starting with verse 14. Scripture's gonna say, listen, if you are a believer, Pressure, temptation, persecution will come your way to try to move you from standing firm on the gospel. But keep your eyes fixated. Have a steadfast hope. I love it. He praises earlier. He says he's praising them for the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. They're steadfast in their hope. And what is the hope that you should remind yourself of as you help, as you stand firm right there? It's right here. This is 1 Thessalonians 4:14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, again, those who die. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. This is the important part. And so we will always be with the Lord, no matter what comes your way. Even if it ends your life, you have a hope beyond the grave. And I love it. It says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Allow that hope to just hold you fast. So he's kind of new to the faith, Ace is. He doesn't, he wants to stand firm. He reads the different scriptures. And so he puts his feet together like a noob, And he closes his eyes. This is really bad. And then he has really rigid hands. Okay. He is standing firm. It's happening. It's it's not a good way to stand firm. And persecution, temptation, or pressure comes, and it hits him, and he, he steps out. Now, this is a great question. Is he still a believer? Yeah, two weeks ago, we talked about sanctification, this process. But he just compromised. In his business, he went back to his old way of doing business where you kind of cheat, steal, a little bit of lying. It's not too bad. He went back to that, and God's saying, let's get back up, and let's learn a better way to stand firm because that way isn't good. And so here it is, the commands of Scripture, the first one, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong. It's a command to stand firm in the faith, but what did it say right before that? It says, be on the alert. So maybe this time, no, no eyes closed. Keep them open, right? It's like, hey, you believers, 
Persecution, affliction, it's coming your way. Be on the alert. Know that. I've already told you before it comes. Don't be taken by surprise. Your eyes should be open. Like, God, I know this is a part of the normal Christian life. It's not hitting me unaware. I know that if I follow you, it's not making life comfortable. I love what uh, C.S. Lewis said. He says, if you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. I think... Okay, Lord, you're not calling me to comfort. You're calling me to follow you. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. That means he's leading you through the valley of the shadow of death. But your rod and your staff, they comfort me. All right, second. So first, we're gonna keep our eyes open. I love Ephesians 6.11, another command in the Bible to stand firm. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. In other words, the devil's gonna try to move you. So rather than your feet together like this, why don't we spread them out a little bit, Asa? Nice work. Bend the knees a little bit because he's saying right here, hey, you don't just have opponents inside the physical realm, but there's a spiritual war going on. He's gonna use schemes to try to move you off of the gospel like what? Well, the answer is that Jesus is the breastplate of my righteousness. So he's gonna try to get you to question, are you really worth, is it okay that you're a pastor? Like, I know what you've done or thought. Or your helmet of salvation, are you really saved? And he's like, no, you stand on that thing. You stand saying, no, I was saved because of what Christ has done. He's my helmet of my salvation. He's my breastplate of righteousness. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, it says, so then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by the letter. He's like, before the the people of Thessalonica, they were idolaters. They worshiped worshiped idols and lived uh, an unholy way of living. He's like, not only did we share you this gospel, we actually modeled for you consistent gospel living. He's like, stand firm with these practices and these ways that we showed you how to live and don't go back to that idolatry and don't go back to that former way of living. Even though everybody else is living that way, you live differently. You live counterculturally based upon the truths of the gospel. And so rather than your hands being really rigid, what if, because you're not a victim in this persecution, what if you kind of had it so you could absorb? Because in Thessalonians, he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How do I overcome evil with good? He says, pray for those who persecute you and love your enemies. You're not just someone receiving persecution. You can actually respond with prayer and love which is countercultural. It doesn't happen in this world. But then when it comes and it tries to knock you off and it's just coming at you and you're like, how long, oh Lord? You know what you believe and why you believe it. Your eyes are open. You're on the alert. And as they persecute you, you actually respond to them in love, which sometimes just aggravates them even more. But your whole time you're praying, Lord, open their eyes like you opened mine. Lord, I I know that they're hurting me and they're saying nasty things about me, but I want them to experience the forgiveness that I too have experienced. We stand firm. And you know, every uh, analogy, it actually breaks down at some point. Because to be honest, Asa's not standing alone. He was never meant to stand alone. He was meant to stand with other brothers and sisters in Christ who do this together. So when he feels like, I can't do this any longer, I've been hit so many times, they're like, come on, Asa. We got a hope beyond the grave that cannot be shaken. Therefore, we too cannot be shaken. And we stand firm. And when one person compromises and they fall off, we're the people that are reaching out to pull them back together. We stand firm together. Thank you. Appreciate it. How many people would like to see Asa hula hoop this thing? <laughs> oh, not, it doesn't fit the sermon. Uh, all right. What are reasons in your life, pressures, in your life, trying to get you to move off of believing or living consistently with the gospel. Maybe old habits. Before I came to know Jesus, you had these habits that were sinful, and you're like, I kind of want to go back, especially when it's stressful. You know, I've been reading a book with my daughter about Brother Andrew. Uh, During the time of the Soviet Union, they made it illegal to distribute Bibles, and so he snuck, he smuggled Bibles behind the Iron Curtain to distribute them so churches and people could read it. Sometimes there's a law that says, hey, sorry, you can't stand there. It's illegal. And you're like, listen, I want to submit to my governing authorities, Romans 13. But I have to stand here. Even if you make it illegal for me to stand here, I will. And I've been talking to my seven-year-old daughter about this. 
because I want her to know, okay, what's that, where's that spot where we say, no, I will continue to stand firm when they say, you can't believe or stand on the gospel. You stay put, you stand firm. Or what about cultural expectations? Hey, Asa, you celebrate sin or we will call you names. He's like, I can't celebrate it. I can love that person. I can present them the gospel. I can engage with them. I can have them over for dinner. It's like, but I can't celebrate it because that wouldn't be love. Love would be showing them the same way that I was saved. I can't celebrate sin. They're like, well, then we will taint your public reputation. Like, I'm hoping you don't. But even if you do, I have to stand firm right here. I've got a hope that you can't touch that's imperishable. Sometimes it's the news, which can be used for good, but it also can be used to try to dissuade us from standing firm. Like when Time Magazine, it turned Nietzsche's quote, God is dead, into a question, is God dead? 1966, the guy, the journalist writing, he's like, hey, modern technology kind of has explained all the way the need for a God. I don't think we need him anymore. Asa, you kind of look silly standing there in that hula hoop, standing firm on the gospel. We all figured it out that he's not needed anymore, which is why you bend those knees and you know why you believe what you believe. Just last week, uh, I was down at Post Falls Camp with Bill Krause, and we were going through evidences for the resurrection, because maybe you're like, I believe the resurrection. Great. Now I'll learn why you believe that there's a resurrection. All the evidence that points forward, this was an actual historical event. Learn that too so that when they're saying these things, you're like, no, no, no. I've looked at the evidence. I've studied the science. It's pointing towards God. And you know, one of the hardest pressures can come from the family and friends that are so close to you. They can vocalize their disapproval. They can say things like, after all we've done for you, you're gonna do this, you're gonna, you're gonna believe this, you're gonna live this way, this countercultural way. And you can say, listen, I love you. I wanna honor you as my father and mother. I, I want you to enjoy what I am enjoying. And if, if they're like, you know what? It's me or him. They're like, please don't make me choose this. I want you to be enjoying this too. But we stand firm. Sometimes it's in a calling, something God's been putting on your heart to do, but your friends, your family, they're the ones that are like, I don't really know, that sounds risky or dangerous. And you're like, okay, God, help. Speak through godly counsel. Speak through my circumstances. Is this truly what you want me to do? And if so, God, let me believe. Let me believe that you're calling me to do it and let me go forward knowing that your opinion, it surpasses everybody else's opinion. Lord, because there's only gonna be one person judging me on judgment day, it's you. You're gonna say I'm righteous because of what he did on the cross. And so I move forward in faith which is why we come to a conclusion right now, a very important one, which is in order to stand firm, if you're gonna obey the many commands of scripture to stand firm, you need to learn to resist. It means that there is a biblical form of resistance. It is a resistance to expectations and pressures that desire you to move away from believing and living the gospel. I wanna clarify, not all resistance is biblical. Not all resistance is biblical. In fact, most resistance stems from pride and rebellion. Most resistance usually looks like not being willing to listen to good counsel or submitting to authority, and I'm not advocating for that. So rather than show you all the negative examples, let me give you one beautiful example. Marie Durant, a 14-year-old girl in 1730. Her brother was a pastor who believed that God intended that the Bible be able to be given to the common person and read by the common person and that the Holy Spirit would help you understand what you're reading. They believed that so much, but they're, at the time, uh, the Catholic Church, that was a heresy in their worldview. And so as he was passing out Bibles and making it, his sister, 14-year-old Marie, she too was promoting this idea that you could read the Bible for yourself. So she was thrown in the prison called the Tower of Constance in France, and It said, and I try to check, fact check this, you can do your own fact checking, that every week a priest would come to her and say, do you recant? Which means, I disagree with what I formally said, I'm sorry, I don't don't stand on that anymore. And for 38 years, she said, no. You can go free if you'll just recant. And she says, no, no. She believed that this book is God's word 
and that by keeping it from people that they too could read, but we are actually robbing people from understanding God's word that it had been written in such a way that we should be able to read it up and it would be a light to my path and a lamp to my feet. And you know what? You can actually travel to the Tower of Constance where she was kept for 38 years and her and her friends, they wrote this in the stone, which is in French, and it means, I resist. They asked, do you recant? And so she carved in stones. I resist, biblical resistance, humble, powerfully strong. I will stand firm in the gospel. You will not move me because I have a hope unshakable beyond the grave. So we're gonna look for the next four weeks at a biblical model of what it means to stand firm. And we can find that modeled in here by the early church. So let's pick up our story. The great persecution was put on Uh, in part by, not all of it, but by this man named Saul who had witnessed the stoning of Stephen, the murdering of Stephen. And so he is not content to just persecute these people in Jerusalem. He's like, I'm going to Damascus, north of Israel. And so he gets the authorities to say, go ahead. And he's traveling to Damascus when he is interrupted on his journey by the risen Jesus who blinds him and talks to him. Acts 9, you can read the whole thing. And he is forever changed. God heals his sight later on, and now he changes his name from Saul to Paul. He proclaims that Jesus is the Messiah, that he truly did rise, and he knew because he had talked to him and seen him. And he proclaims that, and now the one who is persecuting the church is the one who they're trying to kill and stop by persecuting him. And so he goes on a missionary journey and plants churches, comes back to his home church of Antioch. He goes on a second missionary journey, and he arrives at Thessalonica in modern day Greece. Let's go to Acts chapter 17 with me. I'll flip there. You flip there too. Acts 17. We'll read the story. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Now, when they had passed, the they is Paul, Silas, and Timothy, through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul went in, as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, that would have been three weeks, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. As you are obedient and you proclaim the love of God, some will respond with joy like some did here. As did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women, but the Jews were jealous Some will respond with jealousy. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason. Jason is the host home of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. So they attack it, looking for Paul, seeking to uh, bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they had heard these things. And when they had taken money and security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Okay, if you know anything about planting a brand new church, three weeks is not a long time. He only gets three weeks and he's sharing and some of these people are turning from idolatry to worshiping Yahweh. And so they're baby believers. They're brand new at their faith. And this jealous Jewish uh, leadership gets a whole mob of people in the city to attack the house where they thought they were, Jason's house. They couldn't find him, so they beat up Jason and they have have him uh, post bond. And so there's all this anger to this idea that Jesus is the Messiah, and they actually send Paul, Silas, and Timothy away by night. Okay, you guys go. And you think Paul's going away thinking, God, what's going to happen to this brand new church as they receive, right off the bat, persecution for their faith? What's going to happen? Let's pick up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. The story continues. It says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you again. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? You, for you are our glory and joy. He's like, 
man, I tried to like U-turn and come back to make sure you guys were okay, but I couldn't because Satan was hindering us. Chapter three of 1 Thessalonians, verse one. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. We sent Timothy. He's like, fine, if I can't go, Timothy, you go. Our brother and God's coworker in the gospel of Christ to do what? To establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. What's the this? Affliction. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass and just as you know. And for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. They're standing on the gospel. Paul leaves. And he's thinking maybe the tempter has tempted them to step away because of all the affliction. God, there's just so many attacks coming. But Timothy goes and he says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about through your faith. This is the last one I'll read. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. He's like, I can just breathe a huge sigh of relief. He's like, I've got my own afflictions over here, but they don't even matter because guess what? You're still standing firm. You haven't left the gospel, whether believing what's true of it or living it. And he's like, I could just, I'm okay. I'm okay now that Timothy has brought me that report. So here's what we wanna do. For the next four weeks, we're gonna be going through 1 Thessalonians and then 2 Thessalonians. My challenge to you is to read the whole book. It takes 10 minutes to listen to it on audiobook, audio version. So read it once. If you want a harder challenge, read it through multiple times in multiple different translations, the ESV, the NLT, the KJV, you name it. Read it a couple times. If you're married, read it with your wife. If you have children, read it with your children. Read the book of 1 Thessalonians. And you'll get this backdrop by which all the next four sermons will be built off of as we look to that church and they received affliction so early on and they stood firm. And we're gonna draw out of that book many things that apply to us today. And here's my, my thoughts just to leave you is to ask what we started with. What is it that is your greatest hope? What are you chasing? Man, if I could just get that. I just wanna get there. Is it to see Jesus face to face? Do you have hope? Are you full of despair? Because if you are full of despair, I've got good news that Jesus is our living hope and he offers himself to you today. That you would come and you would know we're gonna have some people that will be up here and up here and they're willing to pray with you and for you and you can ask them, explain to me the gospel more clearly. Because the invitation to accept and receive the gospel and to have a living hope beyond the grave is available to you right now. And if you're a believer, what pressures are you up against to move and compromise, whether it be at home or in the workplace? And how do you say, okay, God, I'm sorry, I've compromised right here in my personal life, in my, me being a father or a husband is the way I do business. Lord, help me back here. God, give me a community that can help me stand firm against the pressure that I feel going on around me. And we do it this way. We look back at the resurrection of Jesus. We we look back at what we celebrated last week and said, that's right, he walked out of that tomb. And we look forward to our future physical bodily resurrection. We say, I too will resurrect someday and I will be with you for eternity. And in the middle, until either you come back, Jesus, or I die, help me to be faithful. Help that hope to change how I live right now, to enable me to stand fast no matter what comes our way. My hope cannot be shaken because it's you. Therefore, I can. Hope is founded.